My name is Philip Asherson from uh, King's College London. I'm going to talk today about ADHD in adults. Um, and I've been given a series of questions about what ADHD looks like and how we might think about treating adults with ADHD. So the first question is, what is it like to have ADHD? So when we think about how we define ADHD, um, we have these three symptoms of inattention, hyperactivity and impulsivity. Um, and in adults, in general, it's the inattentive symptoms that cause greater problems. So when you're very young, um, a young child is often hyperactive and impulsive. In middle childhood, uh, the inattentive symptoms become more problematic. But in general, as you get older, the hyperactivity and impulsivity tends to decline. Um, although many adults with ADHD still feel restless, they can still feel very, be very fidgety, and they're very often impatient. For example, if you ask adults with ADHD about waiting in line at the supermarket, they often find that's a situation when they get very irritable. Um, some of them actually leave all their stuff behind and walk away when, when that kind of impatience is very severe. But uh, the greatest problems uh, are, are often coming from the uh, inattention. And that can take the form of being very distractible. And the distractibility can both be sort of internal in the sense that their thoughts are on the go and flitting from one thing to another. So it's very hard to focus on one thing at a time. So for example, if they're trying to read a page in a book, maybe their mind keeps wandering off and they can't follow what they're reading. Or they're trying to listen to a conversation, you know, their mind's wandering off and they're not listening well to the conversation. But at the same time, they may also be very easily distracted. So if there's any kind of noise or other activity going on, they might be immediately distracted from what they're doing. Um, and then they may find it very hard to then get back to focus again, you know, back on what, what they're doing. So related to these problems, adults with ADHD are often reporting problems with being disorganised. Um, they're often very forgetful. They may miss appointments. The sense of time is often changed. So they, they, they uh, either think time's gone very quick or very fast and they're very um, poor at understanding how long things are taking. I mean, interestingly, although ADHD is defined as an attention deficit disorder, uh, it's probably, we should probably think of it more as a dysregulation of attention, because we know that uh, many adults with ADHD can actually focus on some things very well, and, um, and people often refer to that as hyperfocus. So you may have adults playing sort of hours on computer games, for example, or just focusing on the one thing that they most enjoy but uh, at the same time they're not paying attention to anything else. So this is kind of dysregulated um, attention. So these are the sort of problems adults with ADHD have. But there's also a very wide range of severity. So at the one end you get people who are very high functioning. So for example we work with many students you know, who did well at school and are doing good degrees, but they're sort of coming up against the problems. Um, that their sort of attention span and organisation is giving them within educational settings. But on the other hand, another part of ADHD can also be very impulsive. Um, we have patients with a lot of substance abuse. Um, I work in prisons, so we know that um, about 20% of, of prisoners have ADHD. So it can certainly also be associated with much more severe range of problems. Um, and, and, and overall, there's a very wide spectrum of severity in terms of the impact that ADHD has on people. So when we think about the sort of patients that come into our clinic, um, you can see we've got these sort of high functioning cases and also more severe cases. And also you often see comorbid problems. And so ADHD is not always an isolated problem. And very often people come along with um, other difficulties, such as being very anxious, you know, depressed or low in mood. Um, you know, I already mentioned substance abuse um, and, and a range of behavioural problems. And we've started to do research um, looking at ADHD within other clinical settings. And so, for example, um, in one of our studies, we're looking at patients with borderline personality disorder. And so far, uh, we have found that between 30 to 50% of those patients meet ADHD diagnostic criteria. And this actually matches well with the, with the current literature. Um, 
One interesting um, issue that came up recently is the relationship between ADHD and being overweight or being an obese. And I have to say I found that rather surprising because I thought patients with ADHD were generally very restless and overactive, you know, they tend to like running a lot. And I thought they'd be thin and wiry. But the literature seems to show actually there is an association with being overweight. Um, and there was a recent meta-analysis that demonstrated this. And most fascinatingly, um, um, another very recent um, analysis from Jonna Kunzi's group showing that a polygenic risk score for ADHD actually predicts um, increasing BMI within a general population sample. So there does seem to be a link between ADHD and being overweight or obese. Um, that has come into the clinical domain in the United States, where one of the key treatments for ADHD, the stimulant drug called Listexamphetamine, is actually licensed for the treatment of bulimia, which is a kind of binge eating disorder. Um, so we don't really know um, a lot about the causes of this relationship. It could simply be a kind of genetic correlation. But I think a lot of people um, are interested in the idea that um, eating um, or overeating may be part of an impulse control problem. And so maybe being overweight has a relationship to ADHD because of the impulsivity and difficulty in sort of self-regulation and self-control of behaviour. And uh, how is ADHD usually treated? Well, in the UK we follow NICE guidelines and they actually say that um, the first choice treatment would be a medical treatment. Um, possibly the main reason for this is there may not have been enough research on alternative treatments, but the evidence is that um, psychological treatments on their own, although they may have a, a wide range of benefits, they may not actually get at reducing core ADHD symptoms. So medication, uh, there have been a lot of treatment trials, and the two main treatment uh, groups that are used are stimulant medications, so these are things like methylphenidate and dexamphetamine, um, and then non-stimulants, which are drugs like um, atomoxetine, and more recently um, people have been using guanfacine. Um, the drugs work in a slightly different way. Stimulants are, are an interesting uh, group of drugs because the effect on ADHD symptoms is very rapid. And in fact, the effects also wear off very rapidly. So if you take short-acting stimulants, then over a four-hour uh, four period of time, you get a good control of symptoms, but then after four hours, the medication comes out of the, of the system and all the symptoms come back again. So it's quite interesting to sort of think about how you could track that and use that in, your, in, in research studies. And we've been very interested in um, one of the mental aspects of ADHD, the mental phenomena, which is people describing how their mind wanders, um, wanders away. And that, that seems to be something that people can describe, are very aware of and can describe very accurately. And so when you take medication, you get a reduction in this kind of mind wandering, but as the medication wears off, all the symptoms come back again. And people with ADHD use uh, these sorts of medications in very different ways. I think the more severe cases, um, particularly if they have problems with um, emotion dysregulation, getting very irritable and angry, or really functioning at a very poor level uh, without medication, I mean, these, these people often feel they need to have medication on board most of the time, so they have good control of their symptoms for as much of the day as possible. On the other hand, there are other groups of people who, in a way, they quite like their ADHD. I mean, interestingly, this kind of mind-wandering state can also be quite creative, and people can come up with all sorts of interesting ideas. And not everybody is, feels that they want to have that controlled all of the time. And I've worked with um, uh, uh, various uh, musicians and comedians, for example, who, when they're trying to come up with new ideas, prefer not to take their medication. But when they want to write things down and actually get something done, they, they find that they have to take medication. So it's quite interesting that people, um, you know, high, particularly higher functioning people with ADHD, can use a, their medication in, in these different ways. There might also be differences between stimulants and non-stimulants, but we know less about that. Um, but there was a very interesting recent finding from uh, Jeffrey Newcorn's 
group in the United States, showing that you could actually see differences in the um, uh, activation of the striatum in the brain that actually separated out treatment effects of um, stimulants from atomoxetine. But at the moment, we, we really don't know very much about the differences in their impact on ADHD. And um, I mean, they, they both treat you know, all aspects of ADHD based on our current understanding. Um, are the medications safe and does it help everyone? Well, I think uh, like every other medication in psychiatry, it's true that not everyone with ADHD responds to medication. Um, we actually know that around two-thirds do respond to stimulants and if you take either methylphenidate or dexamphetamine there's a very high chance that you will show a response. On the other hand, when you compare the quality of that response to a healthy control, you often find that yes, people are better, there is more control of symptoms, but they still don't get to the level of people who never had ADHD. So there often still is a gap between people with and without ADHD, even when they're on medication. And so this is one of the reasons why sort of thinking beyond just a medical treatment and thinking about um, the psychosocial problems and the support structures um, and the kind of practical advice to help people live and cope well with ADHD is also very important. And there is a wide range of adaptations that people with ADHD can, can, can uh, take to become more aware of their mood changes, um, to, to think of strategies for dealing with things like forgetfulness and timekeeping. Um, and so I think, um, so certainly psychosocial treatments are very important. Um, another question is uh, whether non-pharmacological treatments can get at the core of ADHD, and this is still very much uh, debated. Um, currently there is no really hard evidence that that is the case. Um, and so, we, so in general, we think of um, psychological treatments such as cognitive behavioural therapy um, or coaching interventions as really supporting and helping people with ADHD um, uh, partly sort of manage their daily lives. And also the comorbid problems, you know, getting anxious or depressed or other problems that, that run alongside ADHD. But there is interesting um, uh, lines of research that, that could be very fruitful. And one of those seems to be mindfulness-based um, interventions, like a kind of meditation treatment, uh, which may actually be sort of training the core aspects um, of neural function that might bring about reductions in ADHD. And in a similar line, people are very interested in the use of neurofeedback techniques. You know, if you understood better the mechanisms, the neural functions that underpinned ADHD, you could try and target those things and improve those functions, you know, without the use of medication. And there may be uh, sort of general strategies that are very helpful. And we can look at um, people with ADHD who are actually functioning very well in life. And some of those people um, are athletes. And there are fantastic examples of people with ADHD who have got gold medals at the Olympics. Um, um, you know, you do see ADHD in a wide range of different sports. So there's something about the sports activity which is sort of very adaptive and something that people with ADHD can really excel at. And so it's an interesting question to think about whether going uh, exercise from an early age and then being involved in um, sports activities can actually bring about sort of long, long term improvements and be a kind of protective effect. Um, on, on either ADHD itself or the kind of problems that ADHD can generate um, around it. So as part of COCA we are also looking at some other aspects of ADHD and particularly thinking about sleep problems and also problems with mood. I mean mood problems are very well established in ADHD and um, there's a, a big literature on emotional instability which is where your kind of mood or your emotion sort of changes from one moment to the next and people typically get very irritable or angry or frustrated. Um, and in fact you do get good treatment effects of um, ADHD medications on emotional instability. Um, but one of the other outcomes of ADHD is those emotional problems actually turning into kind of more sustained problem with low mood low self-confidence and then that can turn into depression and so people uh, having episodes of, de of depression is much more common in ADHD 
and also people having chronic sort of dysthymia, chronic low mood states, is also very common in ADHD. So we don't fully understand all the reasons for that. Um, and part of it could be having emotional instability, because that in itself is a risk factor for developing depression. Excessive mind wandering could be a risk factor for depression, because if a lot of negative things have happened in your life, you may be exposing yourself to a lot of uncontrolled negative thoughts. And we know that excessive mind wandering is in itself a risk factor for depression. And I suppose the other, fact, the other important thing is that people with ADHD may often be struggling right through their lives from an early age. There's a kind of accumulation of problems and difficulties. And maybe people around them may be very critical of how they're performing. And so all of these things can affect the way somebody's um, sort of feeling. Um, the other, um, um, the other um, a separate problem in ADHD can also be sleep problems. And in a way that can't be entirely um, independent of depression because we know that when you have depression you often have sleep problems and if you have a lot of sleep problems that does affect your mood so there's clearly some kind of relationship there as well. Um, but typically um, the majority of adults with ADHD will find it very hard to um, get off to sleep or children and adults with ADHD and probably around 80% or so of people with ADHD have sleep difficulties. The main problem is usually sort of late onset insomnia. So they, uh, so they find it very difficult to get off to sleep and they often don't fall asleep until the very late hours in the morning. Some people with ADHD may in addition have a kind of disrupted sleep. Um, and so there may be more than one problem going on, both a delayed sleep onset but then also a disrupted sleep. And of course all of these things can actually increase problems with inattention. Um, people who study sleep disorders link it to inattention and mind wandering. Um, and another aspect of sleep problems in general is it causes emotion dysregulation. So some of the problems we think of as ADHD related can also come from having sleep problems themselves. So there's still quite a debate in the field as to maybe what is coming first and what is the interaction between ADHD causing sleep problems and a sort of and a sleep problem causing ADHD. So of course the study of circadian rhythms and thinking about how you could treat and improve sleep, you know, could have huge benefits both for sleep and mood and emotion dysregulation and ADHD itself. 